Well, good morning to all of you. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Amen. How good it is to be in, in this house. How good it is to be with you folks. It's so good to, to share in worship and uh, to share in your joys, to share in your, in your challenges in your life. How good it is when we gather. How good it is when we encourage one another. This life is difficult enough as it is. And I pray for those that are out there. They don't have anyone. And I consider myself so blessed to have a church family that whenever I'm in need, I have a church family that lifts me up, that prays for me. And I hope that we do the same for you. So how good it is to be here. So good to see my sister Tony here. Uh, how amazing it is after her surgery that she's already back on her feet and she's here worshiping the Lord. And so it's good to see you. It's good to see all of you here. If you have your Bibles with you, if you'll please turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 13. 1 Kings 19, verses 9 to 13. If you find yourself there, if you'll please stand with me as we read 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 13. And the word of the Lord says, There Elisha came to a cave, and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elisha? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And God said to him, Go out, and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountain and broke it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Lord Father, what a privilege it is to be here. I thank you for the privilege to share and to speak the truth of your word, I thank you for its eternal gift to humanity. I thank you. It's unchanging. It's inerrant. It speaks to all reality and truth. I thank you for it. brings life. May the words that I speak today bring life. May they bless us, Lord, to walk according to your ways. May you speak through me. May today I be a mouthpiece for you. I speak and I thank you in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen. May be seated. America is suffering from a noise epidemic. Our culture is bombarded by noise every day. Traffic, loud music, TV, yelling, screaming, crying babies, phones going off. And even angry people at work. Some of you may know something about that. And just as bad as the loud noise is, is the persistent and constant interruption of that noise in our life. We're constantly interrupted. How long do we have a moment to, to concentrate or focus or work on something before we're interrupted by something? Before noise comes and cancels out our thoughts. They say that silence is golden, but it's also rare. How rare peace and silence has become in our culture today. It's hard today to find moments of peace and quiet. And especially if you have kids. It's called noise pollution. Noise pollution. And it's now so common that we've now adapted it as part of our normal life patterns. Never before has society been 
so loud as it is now today, especially with pastors screaming over pulpits. But it's an epidemic. Over 30 million people in the United States are exposed to hazardous sound levels at their workplace every day. Did you know that? Psychology Today reports that the number one cause for hearing loss is not age, it's noise. Studies show that the constant disruptions of noise affect a child's developing brain. Did you know that? That the noise of today and all the interruptions, they affect their brain patterns. TV, video games, loud music, they make it so that children are not able to concentrate in silence. They're not able to concentrate for so long because they're bombarded with noise and all these patterns. They can't concentrate in silence, which affects their ability to learn, which affects your ability to take tests. And many kids can't sleep at night. It's too quiet. And the disruptive effects of noise also affect spiritual life. Ask yourself if these things pertain to you. Studies show that the bombardment of noise has impacted people's ability to pray and for the extended periods of time. In other words, the studies show that today, people pray for less periods of times than before. And many attribute that to the inability to focus because of noise, because of interruption. So that Americans today are less able to pray in silence and solitude than ever before. And for many, silence is so rare that it's actually uncomfortable. Have you ever heard yourself say, it's too quiet? And with all the noise that we encounter every day, it's no wonder that we can't pray in silence or hear the whisper of God. And today, I want to talk to you about the whisper of God. And I think that the story of Elijah tells us something about the whisper of God. The great Elijah, the great Elijah, the most revered and celebrated prophet of the Old Testament. And yet here we find him described in a way that is less than flattering. You would be hard pressed to find another person, a greater story of courage in the face of insurmountable odds than the great Elijah here at the Mount of Mount Carmel, going up against insurmountable odds, hundreds of, of, of uh, false prophets taking on the nation by himself. No greater story than the story of Elijah. Here's a lone prophet whom God calls to confront a nation and perhaps the wickedest leaders of all time in Israel. King Ahab and his queen, Queen Jezebel. If anybody ever calls you Queen Jezebel, it's not a compliment. These leaders lied to the people. They stole from the people and they even committed murder to cover up what they had done. They may have fitted very well with today's politics. They abandoned God. They replaced God's altars with altars to worship the pagan gods, Baal and Asherah. And if you would have walked the land of Israel at that time, you would have, you would have been hard pressed to find an altar of God. You would have seen everywhere altars to Baal and to Asherah because those were the gods that first Jezebel worshiped and then convinced her husband, King Ahab, to follow. And so God sent Elijah, the great Elijah. And through Elijah, God declared that since Israel had turned their back on the Lord and they had turned their back on his word, that no rain would come to the land. See, there was a spiritual drought in Israel, a spiritual drought. The word of God couldn't be found anywhere. You couldn't find the word of God. So God sent a real drought to Israel. There's a drought in the land because my word can't be found. So now I will not send rain. And it did not rain for three and a half years. How interesting that every time there's a drought in the Bible, every time that there's a famine in the Bible, there's a spiritual drought of God's word happening at the same time. And that is no, no coincidence. There's a reason why Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. And I pray that the church may always saturate the land with God's word. That this land, that the places where we live are never a drought of God's word. That we always saturate the land with the teaching and the preaching of God's word. 
And of course, naturally, Elisha wasn't very popular. You're not going to be popular if you declare the Lord has said it's not going to rain. Rain was life. Rain was agriculture. Rain was food. And so Elisha was not popular for this prophecy and he became a wanted man. King Ahab put a price on his hand, head and Jezebel sought his life. And so for years, three and a half years to be specific, Elisha ran. Elisha hid until God finally said, all right, Elisha, it's time to confront the king. And on that day, when Elijah confronted him, we read in 1 Kings chapter 18, if you have your Bibles, verses 17 to 19, when Elijah finally confronts King Ahab, we read in verses 17 to 19 of 1 Kings chapter 18, that when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah answered, Oh, I haven't troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel, your, your wife's, your, your queen's table. Go get your folks. Bring them all. 850 of your prophets the ones that you've invited into your palace. And you bring them at Mount Carmel and you tell everybody to come. Long before there was pay-per-view, there was Mount Carmel view. And they came and the people gathered. And there on Mount Carmel in the presence of thousands of onlookers, Elisha, the great Elisha, a lone prophet standing alone, took on 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah. And he won. Remember, you plus God equals a majority. And the rules were easy. The rules were easy. Prepare a bull, put it on an altar. Then I want you to cut some wood and I want you to place it around the altar. And then we read in verse 24 that Elijah tells them, and then you call upon the name of your God and then I will call upon the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. Rules were simple. Put your bull on the altar. Put your wood up there. You can go first. Well, I want you to call out to Baal. I want you to call out to Asherah. I want you to sing to your God. And then I'll go. And I'll do the same. And the one who answers by fire, that's God. And they agreed. They said, okay. The rules sound good enough. And they did just that. And the prophets of Baal went first. And they started early in the morning. And then went all that morning, all the way up until noon, they were screaming to the heavens, Oh, Baal, answer us. Send down fire from heaven. They were dancing. They were singing. But no one answered. We read in verse 27 that at noon, after hours and hours of doing this, that Elisha mocked them, saying, Maybe you need to cry louder. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's hard of hearing. Cry aloud for he's a God. He's way up there. You need to sing louder so that your voice can reach the heavens. Either he is musing or maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he went to the bathroom. So just keep going. Maybe he's just getting back from the bathroom. Or maybe he went on a journey. Or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. I love his, I love his uh, sense of humor. <laughs> but they did. They started screaming even more. More noise. More chaos. Louder. 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 But no one answered. They cut themselves with swords until blood poured forth. They screamed louder. Can't you hear me? But no one answered. That was Elijah's turn. But before Elijah called down fire from heaven, before he called out to God to, to prove that he was the one true God. Before he did that, he did one more thing. He says, wait a minute. Dig a trench around the altar. And I want you to pour water over everything. Put water? Put water. Drench it. And they did. And then Elijah said, do it again. So they poured more water on the altar and, and all the sacrifice and over all the wood. So it was drenched with wood. And then Elijah said, do it a third time. 
And they drenched it again. And now the altar was now drenched in water. Now I want you to read with me in 1 Kings 18, 36 to 39. Elisha stood there. And he looked up to heaven and said, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant and that I have done all these things because you told me to. At your word, answer me, O oh Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, you're God. You are Jehovah. And that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water. Even the water was on fire. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord he is God. The Lord, He is God. And in his victory, Elijah ordered that all those false prophets, that they be gathered and that they be killed. Judgment had come upon them. And then he ordered that the altars of God be restored. That all those altars be, be torn down to the false prophets. And the Lord sent rain. And he blessed the land. The drought was over. The great prophet Elisha. And this is where the story that we read earlier begins. You see, when Jezebel heard that Elisha had killed all her precious uh, prophets, she didn't repent. People like that don't repent. She vowed to kill him. May it be so that on this day, You'll suffer the same thing, Elijah. Go send that message to Elijah. And we read in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3, that when Elijah heard this decree, that he was afraid. And he arose and he ran for his life. The great Elijah, who conquered the Baal prophets and called down fire from heaven. Now he was afraid. He was running for his life. This is a reminder that no matter how great you think you're doing, no matter how strong you think you are in the Lord, all it takes for us to be reduced to fear and cowardice is to take your eyes off the Lord. That's how quickly and easily it can happen. Just ask Peter when he got out of the boat. What happened to him? What happened to Elisha? After this great victory, I'm going to tell you what happened. Elijah expected different results. In his mind, he thought, once that happens, Israel's going to repent. And Ahab and, 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 and Jezebel, they're, they're going to they're gonna repent as well. And then they're going to uh, look at me and they're going to say, you are the true prophet. And they're going to welcome me into the, the palace. And they're going to say, you are the prophet of the one true God. And they're going to they're going to say, we're sorry. And we're going to come back to our ways. And we're going to uh, 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 redeem the altars of the Lord. And, and I'm going to be in the palace. And they're going to uh, look at me and say, thank you, Elijah. Thank you for teaching us the truth. But none of that happened. That's what he thought was going to happen. Instead, he got a death order. What happened to Elisha? He expected Israel to repent. He expected to be received. But God never told him that was going to happen. God says, I didn't tell you that was going to happen. And the same has to happen for us. We, we do the task and we leave the results to God. We have to be very careful when we put our own expectations on what will happen. So Elijah ran into the wilderness. And in chapter 19, verse 4, we're told that he sat under a broom tree. A broom tree. And a broom tree was a shrub, a desert shrub. And the reason they called it a, a broom tree is because the Israelites would prune the branches and they would turn them into, into brooms. So it was a broom tree. And there Elijah rested and he slept. And when he awoke, he looked and there were some 
some bread cakes there waiting for him. The angel of the Lord had provided him with, with food and water. So after he rested and slept and he ate, he was strengthened. And we read in verse 8 that he arose and he journeyed to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. I love this lesson. Wives, if your husband is ever downcast, here's some good teaching. Never underestimate the power of a snack and a nap. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Verse 9. Notice what happens. There he came to a cave and he lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Notice that Elijah didn't come to rest in the cave. Notice that he didn't come to pray at the cave. Notice that it doesn't say that he came to the cave to wait upon the Lord. No, he came to lodge there. You know what that means? I'm living here now. He came to the cave and lodged in it. Elijah was done. It ends and it stops here. Elijah thought it was over. He says, I, I failed. He declared his own mission of failure. And he decided to crawl under a rock, in this case, a cave. And says, here I'm going to wait out my days until I die. It's over. Israel had rejected him. The king had rejected him. And that was his measure for success. That's the way he was going to determine if his mission was a success. He had put his own measures to determine if he was doing good. Do you ever look at your life and you think you're not doing so well, but you then realize, hey, who said that my standards for success are the way to measure my life? For the Lord has his own measures for success and they don't often comply with ours. We do the same thing. We use our own measures for success and all the while God says it is I who decides whether you're successful or not. When I encountered my own moral failure in 2009, I thought the same way as Elijah. I know what it's like to go and find a cave and say, I'm gonna hide under a rock. When we came to San Antonio, I said, I'm gonna hide under a rock here. I'm just gonna live out my days. It's over for me. My life is over, I'm useless. I've messed up my life, there's nothing else. But all the while, it is God who makes those decisions, not us. God says, I ain't through with you yet. And just as God asked Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? I know, because the Lord asked me the same thing. What are you doing here? Irby. Well, Lord, they rejected me. Lord, they, 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 they don't want me. But my son, I haven't rejected you. Amen. You're mine. Amen. Not only did God still have work for me to do, I found out that his greatest work yet in me was still yet to happen. And the same goes for you. Some of you are hiding in caves. Some of you have declared defeat with your own measures, with your own idea of what it means to be successful. Some of you are taking the ill and acting like Elijah here. Well, it's all over. I've made a mess of my life. It's too late for me. This is as good as it gets. This cave is my final stop. And some of you are trapped in a cave of depression. Some of you are trapped in a cave of doubt and defeat. But God is not through with you Yet, what are you doing here? My greatest work is still yet to happen in you. Arise and get out of your cave. We got work to do. First Kings 19 verses 11 to 12. Go with me there, please. And God said to him, Elijah, go outside. And stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and terrible and strong and mighty wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. What's happening here? What is 
what is God teaching Elisha? He tells him to go outside and Elisha experiences a wind so strong that it rips the mountain. He doesn't find God's voice in that wind. Then a mighty earthquake that shakes the land. God's not in that earthquake either. Then a fire scorches the land. God's not in the fire. God could have been. God could have been in any one of those and we would have said is the great and mighty Lord. I mean, I mean, any of these would have been sufficient. But God wanted to teach something to Elisha and he's teaching it to us. Then everything becomes still. And then that quiet solitude, Elisha finally hears the whisper of God, a low whisper. This is what God is teaching Elisha. There's going to be times in your life when things are so difficult, so painful, so confusing in your life, so frustrating when you're going to be downcast, when you're going to be discouraged, when you don't know what to do, when you're going to feel lonely, when you're overwhelmed by the noise of life. And you're going to have to get away from all that. You're going to have to seek me. You're going to have to put away the wind and the earthquakes of your life. Put away all the mighty fires raging around you. Just listen. Just stop. And wait until you hear my whisper. Oh Lord, why can't you just scream over all that noise? Oh no. I'm not going to scream over all that noise in your life because all that noise is the problem. All that noise is what confuses you, my son. All that noise is what distracts you. All that noise is what leads you in the wrong direction and scares you. No. You're going to have to learn to wait in silence and hear my whisper. We have to learn to get away from the worldly noise we have to learn to seek him in solitude, to quiet our souls and to listen with an earnest ear. In the midst of all that noise and chaos, the wind, the earthquake, the fire, it was in silence. See, the bell prophets don't know this. They scream louder and they yell and they do all this stuff, all this chaos to get the attention of their God. God is saying, that's not the way I work. You have to find me set aside everything and you have to seek me and you'll hear me if you'll wait and if you'll listen are you are you surrounded by noise in your life are you surrounded by the noise of criticism do you still hear those voices of criticism in your life what about the noise of bad influence or bad advice you ever had a friend try to give you advice and you heard the advice and you went that's <laughs> terrible advice that's the opposite of what I think I should do. Are you surrounded by the all the, the chaos that leads you in the wrong direction and it's confusing and it's giving you a headache? Are you surrounded by noise? The noise of the world's judgment. It's time to seek the whisper of God. And to find the whisper of God, you're going to need three things. Number one, a whisper requires a peaceful place. Number two, a whisper requires an earnest ear. And number three, a whisper requires a steadfast soul. A peaceful place. You're not going to hear the whisper of God in the chaos of your life. It's going to take a deliberate effort on your part to seek him in solitude. That's exactly what Jesus did. In Luke chapter 5 verse 16, we're told that Jesus would withdraw to desolate places and pray. You don't think that Jesus' life was chaotic? There were crowds that would gather that was screaming, save me, heal me, do this, do that. There was all this pressure. The Pharisees were criticizing them. Everything was chaotic and in those times, Jesus, the perfect man, would go to desolate places and pray. He was never too busy to seek the Lord in a peaceful place. Jesus sought solitude and silence to find God's whisper. And my friends, you need to find your peaceful place too. When was the last time you found God at your peaceful place? Do you even know what a peaceful place looks like? Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. But when you pray, 
Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. In silence, in solitude. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. A whisper requires a peaceful place. And there you're going to find the whisper of God. Number two, a whisper requires an earnest ear. You won't hear the whisper of God if you're not listening. Oh, God's not speaking to me. Oh, yeah, he is. You're just not listening. Oh, I've been seeking the, the voice of God. I just can't hear it. It's because you've got too much noise. A whisper requires an earnest ear. Learn to be still. Learn to be quiet. Learn to seek his voice. And you may not hear his voice immediately. In fact, I can pretty much promise you it's not going to be immediately. You're not going to just sit down and 32 seconds later, okay, I heard the whisper of God. That's not the way that God works. He wants you to learn to be patient and to wait upon the Lord. Learn to have an earnest ear. Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. <clears throat> be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 38, 15. But for you, O Lord, O God, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. Have you learned how to wait? You have an earnest ear. A whisper requires an earnest ear. Seek the whisper of God in patience and stillness and wait upon the Lord. And finally, the third one. A whisper requires a steadfast soul. What good does it do to finally hear the whisper of God if you don't heed what God has to say? What good does it do? Oh, I've heard what God had to say. I just didn't like what he said. So I just, you said go that way. No, I'm going to go this way. What good does it do? When Elijah heard the whisper of God, there was a voice telling him to leave his cave. But Elijah didn't want to leave his cave. But God said, what are you doing here? He sent him to anoint new kings. It was no small task. Anoint the new kings over Syria and Israel and appoint Elisha as the prophet to succeed you. Elisha, there's work to do. What are you doing here? And Elijah was obedient. He heard that whisper and he had the steadfast soul to be obedient. A whisper requires the steadfast soul. Do you have, are you willing to demonstrate a steadfast soul? When you hear his voice, be steadfast in obedience. I want to ask you something today. What would happen if you decided to seek the whisper of God here at New Spirit, what would happen if, if we here, the leaders at New Spirit Church, helped you to find that whisper? What would happen if you decided that today that you're going to cancel out all that noise and you're going to seek him in solitude with an earnest ear and with a steadfast soul? What would happen if you heard that voice and you said, Lord, when I hear your voice, I'm going to do exactly what you say. What if we here at New Spirit Church helped you to do whatever it is that God helped you to, 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 to tell you what to do? What would happen? We here at New Spirit, we want to help you walk your path. It's not just about you coming and sitting down and hearing God's word and then going back out there. It's about teaching you to find your own quiet place, your own place of peace, to teach you to listen and to follow whatever that voice tells you. We are ready to help you. We're ready to guide you. There are leaders here. There are deacons here. There are teachers here. And they'll guide you. God has saying something to you. Are you listening? And if you'll heed that whisper, if you'll look for that whisper, if you'll drown out the noise of your life, God has something beautiful to say to you. And we here, we want to help you accomplish whatever God has said for you to do. We're ready. Please stand with me as we close in prayer. If today you make a decision that you want to seek that place, if, if today you find yourself drowned out by noise and you say, Irby, that's me. There's chaos in my life. There's so much noise in my life, I can't hear God. I want to invite you as I close in prayer to come forward and just stand here. It's not about me. It's not, about, it's not even about you. It's about God speaking to you and I want to I want to encourage you to come and just just speak to the Lord of whatever it is that he puts in your heart 
seek the whisper. Maybe today you might hear that whisper of God. Let's go to the Lord. As the altar's open, I just, Lord, I, I thank you. Because, Lord, I spent so much time drowning in that noise. I spent so much time in the chaos. And, Lord, sometimes life can get chaotic. And I can get confused. And I can't hear you. <coughs> and I can feel discouraged and frustrated with my life and not know what to do. Lord, forgive me because sometimes I don't seek that peaceful place. Forgive me because I don't always seek you with an earnest ear. Forgive me because I don't always seek you with a steadfast soul. So today, Lord, I I come to you seeking that whisper. Speak to me and share with me, Lord Father, what it is that you would have me to hear. Lord, give me the strength to follow and to heed those instructions, the wisdom to understand what it is you're saying, Lord Father, and the faith to stay on that path. And Lord, I pray that Anyone who's listening out there today, Lord, if they haven't made a decision, they haven't heard your whisper because they don't know your voice. They haven't heard you, Lord Father, because they don't belong to you, Lord Father. May today be a change. That today they may say, before I can hear the whisper, I have to first declare you as my shepherd. I have to first hear your voice by declaring you to be my Lord and Savior. Lord, if there's anyone out there that doesn't know you in this way, Lord Father, may they... May they decide today to repent of their sins, to turn from their life, to declare you as Lord and Savior over their life, and to follow in the ways to seek that whisper. And we hear the voice that you've been calling out to us. Lord Father, we ask for forgiveness for our sins. We ask for the blessing and the strength of the Spirit to seek your whisper. And Lord Father, I thank you for this church who is always anxious and willing and determined to hear your voice and to be obedient to that. Lord, I thank you for this church who is obedient. I thank you for this church who seeks you. And may we always, always seek your face. We thank you, Lord, for this great blessing, for this message. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we give thanks and pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a brief uh, church meeting here. And uh, if uh, you need to leave, of course, we thank you for joining us. Uh, but for those of you that are, uh, of course, you don't have to be a member. You're all welcome.